thank you to the Daiwa Foundation for organizing today. I'm really, really pleased to be with you all. Um, many of you might have seen this film already, and if you haven't, then I would really say that this was made as a very collaborative effort. Megumi, who will speak in uh, a moment, was a, a absolutely brilliant producer, director. I think some people, when they watch this film, will be uncomfortable. And the point of the film isn't to make people uncomfortable. Uh, and it certainly isn't a film uh, that is meant to be in any way voyeuristic. Having said that, I think I was really, really surprised as someone that's visited Japan previously and loves Japanese culture, I was very, very surprised at many of the attitudes and many of the themes that we captured. Um, and so you'll see that in this film. I also want to say that this event today is, uh, I think probably maybe six weeks, a couple of months after this film originally aired. And in my career as a journalist, I think I've always really aspired to make content, be it films or podcasts or written articles that will fuel a discussion so that will not end when a piece of work is kind of going out to the world. And this is one of those projects. So since this film aired in the UK and it went out in Japan and it's been out in various territories and it continues to go out in various territories, I think it has fueled a discussion. So rarely a day will go by where I, I don't get a, a notification on my Twitter or someone might email me in regard to this story. And I think that is a really healthy thing. I think this kind of journalism is all about the hope of societal change. And that can only happen as a, a joint effort over a period of time. And I hope today, this meeting, this webinar is part of that. So thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. Right, Megumi, do you want to say a few words? Yes, thank you. Um, and yes, again, thank you to the Daiwa Foundation for having us here. It's so great that, um, as Mabin said, sort of almost two months after this first um, went out at the BBC that we that it's still in conversation and um, and in Japan too it's been sort of taken on by journalists in Japan so it's it's what we wished for and hoped for so um, we're really happy that it's it's gone in this direction and we're really excited to be here to talk to you guys um, today. Um, I don't usually talk about my personal background in in, in things like this, but I think it's relevant for this film. So if you'll allow me, um, as Jason said, I'm mixed Japanese and English. And um, I grew up in both countries and spent my childhood there. And so I speak Japanese fluently and I consider both countries my home. And Johnny's talent, Johnny's boy bands were a big part of my childhood. So this film was um, quite personal to me too. And I say this because I think having that experience and perspective was important and helpful in making this film and combined with all of Mabin's experience um, and the rest of the team's um, experience, we were able to make this really powerful documentary. Um, so, um, so yeah, I just thought it was worth saying that, but um, yeah, thank you again. And uh, we look forward to having a fruitful discussion with you later. You mentioned the age of consent was 13. Yes. Um, it, it, is it clear to you that a crime actually took place? So I think it is clear ultimately that a crime took place. And I think there's various reasons for that. Primarily, it comes down to the quite brilliant work I think the journalists at Bunshin did back in the late 1990s. Um, as you know, and as you will have just seen in the film, uh, a lot of the work that they did ended up being the subject of a libel case that was brought by Johnny and Associates. And when that went to court, um, the vast majority of what had been written in this series of articles was actually upheld. There was one allegation that wasn't upheld, and that was that Johnny Kitagawa was supplying very young men with, with cigarettes. I think it was cigarettes and alcohol, it might have just been cigarettes. But all the other allegations, including that he was um, 
effectively, you know, having sex with these boys and coercing them, th that was all, all upheld as part of this libel case. That suggests to me that there is uh, clear evidence that a crime was committed back then. What we also know is that over a period of decades, you know, many years spanning decades of Johnny Kitagawa's career, he had access to and control over, in many instances, young men and boys who were going through this whole system. And so this is where we get into muddier territory because it, it's not helpful to make assumptions. But I think what we do know is that there has been this drip drip of people coming forward um, over many, many years, including the four people who very bravely spoke in this film, including the multiple people who spoke to Bunshin. And actually it's worth mentioning multiple people who have come forward more recently after this documentary going out. And they all have very similar stories. They all make very similar allegations. Um, so in my mind, it is, it is very clear that a crime uh, has, has been committed historically. Right, so the crime in question would be sexual assault of people who are not consenting. To absolutely, absolutely. And I think, you know, you referenced um, the age of consent there. Uh, of course, you know, there, it, it kind of pains me to say this, but there will be a kind of uh, a very technical way of looking at this, which would be, well, if the age of consent was, was 13 at the time and you had a 14 year old who was consenting, then it, in, a, in a technical sense, surely that can't be sexual assault. And uh, I understand that, but I also think these stories all have a lot in common in terms of coercion. So when you talk about a consenting sexual relationship, in my mind, I'm very, very clear on this, that doesn't involve a power dynamic where someone is saying to you, you need to go along with this or it's gonna have consequences for you. You're not gonna make your debut. It's gonna impact your career. That very clearly is coercion. And there's this element of, of grooming there. I think all that adds up to a, a very clear indication that crimes were committed. Okay, um, well, we've got a hand up now from uh, Kikunaga-san. So could you, thank you, please ask your question. You'll need to unmute yourself. Yeah. Um, my name is uh, Takiro Kikunaga. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, 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 my name is Takiro Kikunaga. I live in Fukuoka, Japan. And yep. then just I want to tell, uh, I am a male survivor of sexual abuse. And then I was sexually abused in London when I was a student of a drama school called Rosewood Hall College in 2001, when I was 29 years old. Mm -hmm. Then just I wanted to tell you, um, uh, as you interviewed uh, some uh, Japanese in Shibuya, all the people are looks are not interested in um, knowing about um, male survival of sexual abuse. It is very important um, point of view, I think. Um, in Japan, people really don't, don't know how male survivors of sexual abuse are not uh, supported or not um, treated properly by the maybe government, local authority, and um, expert like clinical psychologists, psychiatrists. For example, in Japan, there's no um, Male survive, uh, support guideline for male survival of sexual abuse by government. For example, uh, um, a Ministry of Social De Development in New Zealand has a very clear service guideline for male survival of sexual abuse. And the UK government also, last year, they made a guideline for service for male survival of sexual abuse. But in Japan, there's no service for male survival of sexual abuse. So that's why in Japan, people are not, doesn't recognize how poor uh, the society and expert treat and support male survival of sexual abuse. That's why, uh, from my point of view, that's why people are not interested in knowing um, victimization, sexual victimization by Johnny Kitagawa. That is a fact, I think. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you very just, much for just I want to tell you, just I want to tell you, um, 
Ideally, recommend to know uh, not, not only uh, create the documentary film of Johnny Kitagawa's sexual abuse, but also creating the film of how luckiness of uh, supporting male survivor of uh, sexual abuse in Japan. For example, in Japan, rape crisis center never meet male survivor of sexual abuse because they think male survivor become a perpetrator of sexual abuse. That is only myth. Mm. This kind of thing happened in Japan. Yeah, that's what I wanted to tell you. Okay. And uh, you don't want to ask any actual questions. I mean, thank you very much for this very useful comment. All right. Um, well, let, let's move on to... Um, so I think the, the next person who had their hand up is Yuichiro Nakajima. Um, any chance we can see you, Yuichiro? Yep. Yeah. Um, hi there. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Jason. Um, no, thank you very much for that very, very powerful um, film. Um, I applaud you really for making that um, and uh, putting it on air. And I'm surprised that I hadn't been aware of that, the existence of that film until now. But my question is this. One of the comments that struck me from the um, one of the, the men you interviewed, uh, at, I think at the host club in Osaka, he said, um, you know, offer up your ass to this man if you that's how you want to progress your or develop your career and that I think you said came from his mother or well, he said that I think which is one of the most shocking comments I've heard in this whole 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 film um so she if that is true family of this man or people around him or if you take a more wider interpretation, society have been acting as enabler for, for Johnny Kitada to commit his acts. Did you, is that how you saw, I mean, this is a societal issue rather than an individual matter. And I think he, he was able to perpetrate the acts because he was a, a allowed to do so and continues to his his legacy is continue continues to be protected because society lets lets it be protected. Um, uh, I, I won't go on, but but I just want to hear your views um, uh, on that. So who, sure. who wants to tackle yeah. is that for you? Megumi, do you want to take that and then I'll, I'll I'll comment off the back of you. Yeah, if you go first. Um, sure, Yuichiro. Thank you very much for your comment. I think. Uh, as with you, we were also really quite shocked when we heard that comment. But um, as you say, um, it's I think that's the problem that we had with this. Well, not all the problem um, all along was that there was society knew that this was happening, um, but there was very little sort of it just wasn't seen as a crime. Um, and that comes from, I guess, also sort of touches on what our previous um person who spoke to us about talking about how male survivors aren't really recognized in Japan. Um, and I think uh, still today, Japan is quite a homophobic um, society and there's not a lot of, uh, and so, so male survivors, um, so, so uh, yeah, male survivors aren't recognized as victims in any way. Mm. Um, and I think also, the amount of fame that or the power and sort of glitter and sparkle that Johnny's and associates had now, but especially when that particular contributor was talking about it was in the nineties, it was sort of reaching its heyday. They, it's, they, they, it, it came across when listening to all our contributors, it sounded like you, it was the, they, Johnny's associates gave you the golden ticket to success. And so, you know, we heard a lot of people saying, that um, it isn't. This doesn't just happen. It might not just be the case for Johnny and Associates. Just if you if you want something that badly, just close your eyes and just just put up with it. It's only a few seconds. Put up with it, and you get what you want. And that's it's it's not. That's the sort of comments that that's how sexual abuse and that's how it was seen as in transaction. If you know what I mean. And um, and I think that also perpetuated this um, this this problem i also think that because of the um sort of homophobic nature in japan 
this was never seen as a crime. It's seen as a scandal. The way that people spoke about it was seen as a scandal, but this wasn't an affair between two consensual adults. This was a man abusing, manipulating and coercing children. Um, and I think there was, it. Um, it's taken a while for Japan to really kind of get to grips with that. Um, and I hope this documentary sort of, that's what we tried to pinpoint with this documentary as well, is is that's what, what was going on. I'm sure Mabin has more to add. Just, just briefly, yeah, thank you so much for the question. I would say we were consistently, as a team, all of us, we were really shocked by the, the transactional nature um, and the way in which survivors would reference what had happened to them. As you saw, you know, if there's, if there's four people who are brave enough to speak out in that film, I think it's fair to characterize three of those survivors as not seeing themselves as survivors of abuse and not acknowledging what happened to them as abuse. So they are not even at the point where they believe that what happened to them was morally questionable. They don't believe they've survived anything. Um, I knowing what I know would absolutely characterize them of, as survivors of abuse. And I think that the, the point is that what they, how they view what happened to them is, is purely transactional. And I think the point that Megumi makes about uh, kind of casual homophobia, it does really play into this because of course, you know, it's important to say there's a, there's a world of difference between a same sex consensual sexual relationship and the exploitation of, of an individual when there's a huge gap in age, in power, and a child effectively isn't offering consent. They're a world apart. But in sections of Japanese culture, there's a conflation. And these things are seen as one and the same. And that's why you have contributors. You know, a, a lot of our conversations, even off camera, there was this sense of, um, you know, Junya, who was one of the contributors you just heard from, there was a, a sense of him talking about this idea of boys will be boys. And this is just something that boys do which I think is, is unfounded and unjust. You know, we've got to be really, really careful and precise. What these young people experienced was abuse, it was wrong, uh, and it was criminal. Thank okay, you. we've got a couple more hands up. I think the next one is Hannah Kentridge. Hi, I'm Hannah. Um, thank you so much. It was a um, super interesting documentary. Um, I'd actually already seen it because um, I currently work in the Japanese translation unit for BBC World News. Um, so I was part of the team that was um, organizing the provision of Japanese subtitles for this documentary when it was showing uh, in Japan, um, which was a really interesting job because I think it was super, super important that we made sure it was um, translated accurately and, uh, you know, translated accurately so that Japanese people can experience this documentary as it's supposed to be. Um, I was just curious, um, I wanted to ask both Megumi and Mobin, um, what sort of backlash you've had or, or, or what the reception was like in Japan, um, particularly among, I'm really curious what um, the kind of uh, reception was among female fans of Johnny's bands. Um, so, I mean, I just had a cursory glance at Twitter, like the the response to the um, tweet about it on the official BBC Japan Twitter it was mostly people saying this is great this is really important documentary they should show it on NHK so on so on um, but of course Johnny's is huge and has this huge fandom and actually within fandoms like that quite often there's almost a fetishization of man-on-man -on -man relationships um, so I just wondered what sort of feedback you've heard from within Japan um, Meg if I I'll, I'll go for it first and then I'll, I'll hand over to you. I have to say that um, overwhelmingly the feedback from my perspective has been really, really positive. Um, and I'm kind, of, I'm, I'm kind of used to a process after I put kind of work out with my name or my voice or my face associated with it. I'm kind of used to the, you know, the general feeling that I'm sure many people can relate to. You know, you might tweet a link to something and then you check back, uh, you know, after three hours and you get a bunch of abuse. I have to say this, it wasn't the case this time around. I got um, really positive feedback overwhelmingly 
there was uh, lots of people in the online space who were who were taking on the subject matter who were really kind of pushing for a more mainstream discussion inside japan and pushing for broadcasters inside japan to take this on some of you might be aware as well lots of people in the kind of social media space have taken on this issue including um megumi might know the name but there's a kind of very famous youtuber inside japan who has made a, a video about this particular subject after the documentary went out. So I have to say the, the response overwhelmingly has been positive or the converse of that. So it hasn't been negative, but I'm sure there's been a whole section of society, including Johnny's fans, who have just kind of hit the mute button and who are not involved in that conversation whatsoever. And I think that that reflects what we've seen in recent decades. So there's lots of people who are fans of of the the kind of the bands that are produced by Johnny and Associates who just want to look the other way and not get involved. I think those have been the responses. Magumi? Yeah, I'd say um, just going back to your, your point about the fans, it's a really interesting point. And I think um, it's a difficult topic for fans because I think a lot of fans knew that this was going on, but they tried really hard to just ignore it. Uh, as an inconvenient truth for them and they sort of separated the boy bands and the boys that they uh, were supporting um, and this issue of Johnny Kitagawa and the sexual abuse those they, they, they kind of really sort of that's that and this is this and I'm supporting the boys and I'm supporting their career and I'm not supporting they, they, they kind of in their minds they've they, they, they're very clear that there's a difference um so, and I think also a lot of them feel like bringing it up might not, they've got quite of a mixed, they've in turn, a mixed understanding of it. So like by bringing it up, they think that maybe they might be harming the um, fans by and sort of ruining their careers, but actually not talking about it is also not acknowledging the crimes that have happened. And, um, and so, yeah, I think it's a really difficult, um the fans are in a difficult position but ignoring it certainly isn't going to make the issue go away um and so uh yeah it'd be interesting to see how the fans continue to grow because i feel like they they well, a lot of the fans with johnny's fans they feel like they've grown up with the with the talent um so i wonder what journey they're going to take with uh move on with well, I can see we're going to struggle for time because I, there are lots of questions coming up in the chat and and elsewhere. Um, but just taking them in order for the time being, um, Lauren Latouche is Latouche Charles. Um, can we get? Oh, you... uh, uh, hello everyone. Uh, you. Oh, you can hear me? Okay, thank you. Well, firstly, I'd like to thank you very much for today. Um, the documentary was really interesting, and it highlighted parts of idol culture that. I didn't know about so I found it very enlightening I would like to thank you very much for bringing light to such an important crime and case however um, I do have a question uh, regarding the documentary's handling of the victims of um, Johnny Kitagawa's crime because I, in parts I did hear comments such as oh if this is like insane or I can't wrap my head around it and I was wondering more about if if you were to go back to it, would you maybe look more into like the more psych psychological aspects of the victims' mindsets? Because um, for uh, maybe this sounds a bit high-handed of me, but, uh, but for, for example, when some of the victims were like, or um, for example, when they were like, "Oh, I'm really grateful to Johnny," or "I really really love Johnny," it kind of a uh, even though I can't speak for them because I don't know their personal feelings and their emotions, I kind of uh, could relate a bit because there was times where I was uh, went through a hard time with a person and it's hard to separate what they've done to hurt you and from what they've done to help you and piecing all of that together. So I was just, as a piece of feedback, I was wondering, would you maybe look more into the kind of the mindset of kind of victims and maybe why it's such a struggle for them 
Okay, yeah. I think that's one from Rabin, right? Uh, yes. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I'll try to be brief. Thank you so much, Lauren. So I think the the kind of the the mechanism of uh, meeting someone and then capturing a reaction straight away. You know, the whole point of that is to kind of allow an audience to to settle with a thought and think, okay, how do we process this? And I actually, I, I wouldn't change those responses because I, I think what's really important in those moments is to highlight and make a distinction about how grooming works and what grooming is. So in one sense, you can look at those interactions and you can look at someone like Ren, for example, who was in the host club, who makes it very, very clear, you know, Ren says, it was a transaction. If it was offered to me, I would have, I would have gone there. I would have, I would have done that. I, I do find it difficult to wrap my head around that. And the reason for that is it's a kind of crystallized, concentrated version, in my view, of the, the culture of the casting couch, which we've seen in multiple um, geographical locations, multiple industries around the world over a very long time. And this was a crystallized version of that. I think if we get into um, this kind of idea of uh, maybe maybe he was helping them and maybe therefore they forgive him or they, they see him as a good person. I understand that. But ultimately, what is that? I would say it's grooming. It's grooming and that's something that isn't discussed within Japanese society. And actually, it's Nobuki, who's the, who's the therapist who we speak to at the end. You know, we had a very long conversation with him and Megumi spent a lot of time kind of in research conversations with him as well. He was very willing and very able to offer this kind of um, analysis in terms of how our minds work as human beings and how men with immense power, whether it's R. Kelly or Michael Jackson, or in this case, Johnny Kitagawa, will, uh, are master manipulators, actually. They are, they are brilliant at manipulating young people and instilling this idea of a relationship being special and the idea of, you're doing this for me, so I'm going to do this for you. That is how grooming works. And I think it's really important in a documentary like this to have clarity of thought and to not compromise. So even when a contributor is saying, I'm not really sure if there was a problem here, I think we have to have clarity of thought because it is, it's powerful people who exploit that rely on that muddiness. And so we have to have absolute clarity of thought. And that's why I, I wouldn't change those responses. Okay, we've got loads more questions. So we'll have to keep both the questions and the answers short, I think. But I'd love to hear from Liko Muranaka, who's the next person who's got her hand up. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the very great film. I have a very important question for you. Um, after your film came out in B on BBC and also in Japan, I've spoken to many, many journalists for TV or newspaper and asked, what can we do after this thing came out? But none of the journalists said, okay, there is no victim who is actually suing the Johnny Kitagawa or, and Johnny is even dead. It's not a crime, it's news. So what can we do? They were asking me and no media actually directly picked, it, picked this issue up and answered the questions and tried to make an effort. And ultimately only the, the what was his name? Kawan Okamoto came up and said he spoke as a victim. And then some media started to report he appeared on the Foreign Journalist Club of Japan, blah, 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 and nothing else. No Japanese media really pursued this issue. What do you think is the responsibility of the media? And what should they function and what could we do? In Japanese media, I, I really want to ask you a question. Because NHK can just immediately suck up all the Johnny talents from their program or sponsors just pull out any any sponsorship from the dramas using Johnny Johnny's talents or anything, but nobody take actions. What do you think about? It? Thank you. Maybe one from Megumi, is it? Okay, so in the spirit of being brief, I think um uh yeah, it's 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 a problem that not a problem, but the the perpetrator. A hand is dead so what can you do um and a lot of people ask me that same question what's the point of bringing it up now um the silence that surrounded this for 50 60 years is the problem and the media the, and it's a complicit silence the media and the news media are meant to hold 
powerful people, institutions, companies to account. And so that's what the media needs to do. I mean, Johnny, Johnny and Associates can also come out and publicly acknowledge what has happened and give the survivors um, uh, the acknowledgement and uh, of that of, of the, what they went through. Um, but uh, to answer your question, I think, yeah, the news media is there to hold powerful people in, uh, and and uh, institutions to account. And um, right now it's so, especially the entertainment industry and the news industry is so intertwined um, and politics to an extent too, that it's not as, it's not what we think, it, what, what seems simple and straightforward isn't that case in Japan. And that's what we need to continue to highlight and um, fight for. Um, we're gonna run out of time, but, um, I, if I can just butt in and sort of abuse my chairmanship of this meeting, I, I'd quite like to know also from Megumi, what do you think, what difference it would have made if the victims had been girls rather than boys? Do you think that would have made any significant difference in a Japanese context? Adley, I do think that it would have made a difference because I think, um, I, I think there is, uh, um, as I said before, like this casual homophobic nature in Japan, and so this understanding of relationships between males is not really fully understood. But also because of that, um, the it's it's sort of it, even though this is a crime, I think it is fetishized or understood as something else, um, and and it's much more easier to take the traditional route of understanding. A woman being abused by a man and so I think sadly um it might have made a difference yeah okay well we've probably got time for one more so you're the lucky next person Leika Kuroki can we just hear your question you have to keep it you have to keep it short thank you uh I'm Leika and I I was very surprised by this video so thank you but do you think uh, this fact be stopped and uh, what's the way to stop? Because um, it is difficult to stop this because many young men want to debut, so so, yeah. Okay, um, so how, how to stop it? Yes. Yeah. So I, either of you. If I can take that, I'll be, I'll be brief. Um, so I, I think this is always about critical mass. And what I mean by that is you will have in any movement, in any popular movement, in any cultural shift in society, you'll have the, the, the kind of fringes of society that start talking about something and will often be ostracized or, sh or shut down. We know this conversation has been going on since the 1990s and it was shut down. And then you'll have um, you know, people of influence, people in power who will join that conversation. And then there'll be a critical mass of people who will say, this is unacceptable. And I think what is required here is critical mass. So we need more people, more newspapers, more journalists, more vloggers, more people of influence to continue this conversation. I think it's a separate question of whether I have faith that that will actually happen. And the short answer to that is I just don't know. But I am really pleased that, you know, Bunshan continued to report this. NHK, even though I think in the past they made some real mistakes, they did report very briefly on this story. I think it was last month. They did a report on this on, on, on their news. Um, so I hope that conversation will continue to, to build up and to gain traction. And whether it takes months or years, ultimately when there's critical mass, there will be a culture shift and there will be a reckoning. Well, I think that's a great note for us to end on. And hopefully this event itself has played its part in bringing these issues to light. So thank you so much to Mobin and Megumi. Um, but that's going to be all for today. So thank you so much to, to both of the presenters um, and for the documentary. And thank you for all the many people who took part and asked questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.